the beginning of the story. Uh, it was uh, the summer of, so I was, I was a sophomore. I was going into my junior year. It was the summer of summer 2006. I, um, I had woken up uh, from being uh, in the hospital in the ICU. I had just attempted to take my life. Uh, I had been in the, in, in the ICU for, for a couple months already. I woke up, I had 24-7 nursing with me at all times, watching everything I did. Uh, and my parents came in um, with, uh, I had met with the psychologist once, this older lady, um, and pretty much told me, hey, you're going to a therapeutic boarding school. And I was like, what? My parents were told like, she can't discharge from the hospital, she has to go somewhere. Instead of a psychiatric hospital, you know, my parents, uh, I was fortunate enough my parents were able to, um, to find a place. Um, and next thing I know, we got home just to get my bag. My dad and I went to the airport. We got there super early, um, like it was a nighttime flight. And then we got there, uh, got in the rental car. I passed out and I just remember waking up and it was nothing but fields and cows and uh, train tracks. And I was like, where the heck am I? Coming from LA, going to, uh, Spanish Fork uh, in Utah was a big uh, difference. Uh, and I just remember I woke up and I was like, where are we? And we were literally crossing this, uh, tra uh, the train tracks going into like the New Haven entrance. My dad pulled up and I was like, dad, what is this? And he was like, you're only here for a tour. It's okay if you don't wanna go, you're only here for a tour. If you don't like it, that's fine, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, at the time, a lead comes out, greets us at the front door, well, the side door. Uh, we get out the suitcase. We get in and, like, immediately, like, my dad kind of just gives me a hug. And then I go in the office with Mandy and she, like, takes out my suitcase. And I just remember very clearly she started unpacking. I was like, oh, no, no, I'm only here for a tour. Like, that's what I'm here for. Uh, and, uh, and she just gave me the smile of, like, oh, kind of like, I, oh, honey, you know. Uh, and then... Uh, yeah, then my dad said bye to me and I was at New Haven. Um, that was kind of the my experience of getting into New Haven. Uh, very disconnected as to why I was going to New Haven. Clearly the connection of, hey, I just tried to take my own life uh, was not even a thought in my mind. You know, the idea of mental health wasn't something that was dis discussed with within my family or anything. Um, it was in a conversation per se that we had then, you know, I, I was still living very much in this place of like attention was negative. And then I don't know what the shift necessary. It wasn't like a specific moment where I was like, oh, this is, you know, I'm I'm going to make a difference. Right. It kind of and this is where a lot of it comes in uh, with the staff. Um, it, you know, I, I I started noticing that the unconditional like care, right, of, of staff. Um, that no matter what I did, they didn't go anywhere, uh, which is something that for me, it was always, you know, everyone leaves, like everyone's gonna abandon me regardless, right? Everyone's gonna leave. So what, you know, what's the point, you know? And like, I, I couldn't see that I was trying to build relationships through a negative lens. Um, and it was there, they were still there. It didn't matter what I did, they were still showing up, you know, they were still caring, they were still, um, yeah, of course, yeah, there was consequences to my actions, uh, but um, it was it was that that started like slowly. I started opening up my myself and you know letting my guard down and started seeing hope in a way that things were going to be different. Um, that there was a possibility for things to be different, and I just started wanting it. You know, I really did start wanting to do the work. It started being that I had people on my side that wanted to see me succeed. Um, that was a, a huge component. It was that trust with. Uh, with with the staff and with my therapist you know like I, I had a good relationship with my therapist as well um was it ever a concern that you were going to be treated like a kid still when you first got there um no because I, I for me i never i really struggled connecting with people so i'm originally from mexico uh from puerto vallarta and i moved to manhattan beach when i was 13. it, it was a huge cultural shock coming from um Mexico and I moved to Manhattan Beach was which again was another culture shock like mostly primarily uh, white families and especially at that time coming here all of a sudden like I was 
you know, I was looked at as less than for, and I was, and I came and I was like, oh, where are you from? Mexico. I was very proud and I still am. Going to school in the States, it was very different. Um, leaving my family and my, my brothers in Mexico, I moved with my little brother and my, my dad. Um, so there was a lot of that. So I never really had teens friends. Uh, so even, even at New Haven at first, it was really hard for me to like make relationships with teens. And I thought I had to like, overly like give everything right get super like like I became very attached you know and it was also that fear of like losing uh so I wasn't necessarily afraid they were going to treat me like a kid um it wasn't that it was more of like the acceptance of no matter what I did right just how taking the time to talk about stuff that I never really talked about before like feelings right uh that was a huge one um in a way also like being heard right I was like or like you know all right you're you you clearly are sick so here you are right like let's do this and, the, and even though you know it, i realized that's not what i wanted uh, in that way like that attention right and it slowly started shifting to like the the good things and like you know like i was an athlete okay let's play tennis right like let's like i started bonding with with one staff in particular who played tennis as well and like we used to go out there and play like uh, hit the ball you know like positive bonding um in a different approach so this is what the behaviors I was doing, right? And instead of like, you know, just rejecting it or being like, you know, like trying to make me see that it was like it was wrong, right? Making me feel bad or I don't know, like I ignoring it. It was more of like, okay, we're gonna meet her where she's at, right? Uh, and like by meeting her where she's at, she's gonna. I, I was able to like eventually see like, oh wait, this is not at all what I want, right? Like this is not who I am which I, I've learned later on in life is like crucial, right? Like meet teens where they're at um, because you, you know, if they would have tried to do anything different, like I wouldn't have been able to. I don't, well, maybe I could have, it might've just taken longer, right? But like. Was a lot of the, did these feelings change at any point or was it kind of a gradual positive? No, I think that it, it was very much of like wanting, wanting to change. Unfortunately, I think my parents, uh, so like my family's a little bit divided. Uh, I have, I call him dad, right? He adopted me, my dad in the States. I have a younger brother, Tommy, and my mom, um, my biological mom. And then I have my biological dad in Mexico, um, my stepmom. Um, and then I have three brothers from that side of the family. Uh, so it's always been like a clash of families for me, like for me, like, and, you know, have to choose one. And, you know, it's always been really hard. Um, and I think what ended up happening is I was doing a lot of the work uh, for myself. And unfortunately, my parents uh, didn't, keep up when your environment doesn't change it's really hard and uh, so I was I, I was doing the work I was doing everything I had to um, we were doing family therapy we we're doing all that they just weren't at a place where they were able and not both families right like I'm fortunate enough that you know my family in Mexico came out during winter in Utah right uh, to do uh, to do some uh, ropes uh, work and ex experiential work with Carrie and like the snow and it's freezing. And, you know, we're from Puerto Vallarta. There is no snow in Puerto Vallarta. So, um, you know, they that was a huge part. But at that time, my family was definitely divided. It was a weird, you know, tension between my parents, not even like me um, and not the sim They grew up very differently than I did, you know. So it's lack of understanding what that looks like. Um, but uh, it was, it got to the point where it was getting heavy, I think. You know, a big part of it that for me was like really important um, was seeing that like, I wasn't crazy for feeling that, you know, there was something wrong with me. It, like always like, you know, I, I think I felt that way uh, in my family just because my family in the States, no one struggles with mental health, right? Like as opposed to my family in Mexico, emotions are very much of, you know, they struggle, uh, my dad is, you know, he's had his own struggles with like addiction. So like I grew up in a very open environment there. So it was a, a little different family therapy with my mom and dad in the States was a little tense, uh, maybe a lot. And yeah, so, I mean, I think I, I left wanting to things to be different. I ended up going home and um, the biggest thing was I went home and nothing had changed at home. Uh, and um, go back to your regular life. You're gonna start your, your, your senior year, right? I mean, no one knew where I was my junior year. Everyone thought I just had got injured or went to boarding school. So it was like, no one knew what had happened. No one told me that I was still gonna feel sad. I did pretty well for a while. And I think that's where uh, the aftercare is very important, uh, which is uh, a big part that was missed in my 
uh, my journey. Going into it, it was always like, I've always felt like you were the issue, right? Um, this is, you know, here's my kid and fix it, right? Fix them. And and, I, it, and it's just not just my family. Like it's, you know, I've seen it with other families working in the industry for so long, like working in mental health and um, being on both sides from, you know, doing the more clinical and non-clinical and and that's a common thing with families. If the family, if the whole environment, the whole system doesn't change, we're setting up the individual to fail. While I was in New Haven, I had my biggest, like I had a support system, right? Like I had this group of people that were rooting for me and like, you know, yes, when there was things that I did wrong, of course it was my fault, but when there was things that like, it was like my parents were falling short, knowing that I wasn't crazy for feeling that way was crucial. The whole system needs it. And it doesn't affect just them, you know, it affects the whole family. When a kid comes up from like being in 24 seven treatment where literally you're asking, hey, to staff, can you open the cabinet for a glass of water, right? Uh, and then you're going home where there is no locks, <laughs> you know, there's nothing. So there's a lot of healing that goes into it for sure. Not just for like the impact of me being in treatment and what I had to go through, but like as a whole, we need to heal. So. Um, yeah, that's something that's super important and um, why I, I love the family involvement of, um, and when I talk to families now, like, I'm like, hey, it's mandatory. Like, if not, like, we can't help you as much as that sucks saying that. Um, but it's like, what's going to cause more harm, right? And I see it with teens a lot, that revolving door of like going in and out of treatment, in and out of treatment, and it's always a common denominator, like, what hasn't changed, right? And it's the environment at home. When did you decide that despite all that, that you still were interested in continuing down that career path? Oh, it wasn't until years later. Uh, the The turning point really was when I got injured for tennis. Like tennis kind of kept me alive for a minute uh, afterward because it, it brought back all this joy for me. And, and once I got injured, like, it was, I wasn't waking up at 4 a.m. anymore to run sand dooms. I wasn't going to training. I wasn't doing these things. And, you know, that's when I realized all the things that I had destroyed in my life, per se, right? Like, I was like, oh, my, my grades suck. Um, my, you know, like, what am I going to do in my life? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know this. I don't, you know, like, I had no dreams or goals anymore. My dream was to be a tennis player, and that was over. It was, you know, it's a dark time. Uh, it took me a while. Uh, I had a lot of like battles to face, a lot of different things to face. Um, and uh, I was studying psychology at school. And I remember one time I was, uh, I was laying in bed. I just thought to myself, how could I ever help anyone if I can't even help myself? So I changed my career and I was like, I'll do accounting. You know, it was very much of like, leave that part of your life behind. Uh, and the more I ran from it, the more it was like in my face. Fast forward to March of 2012, the end of March of 2012, I, you know, it was uh, another regular uh, crazy Natasha night. At that time, I, I was there, I don't even know where, I wasn't living anywhere. I was on the streets. Um, that night I ended up overdosing all, um, and a lot of things happened. Next morning I woke up and um, I, uh, I just remember looking at my phone and I looked at my phone to call the, the dealer and uh, instead I decided to call um, Colleen Ecker, uh, who used to be my interventionist. She was my professor, my interventionist, my all these things. Uh, and I'll, she put me in treatment a lot of times and I hadn't spoken to her in years, but I called her and she picked up, you know, uh, going back to like that trust, right, of like knowing. Uh, she picked up and next thing I knew it was in the hospital you know, days went by, uh, my, uh, like she and I ended up doing a cold detox at her house. Eventually when I came to, we looked at the dates and my sobriety date ended up being April Fool's 2012. Uh, I did end up working for Colleen, uh, um, as her executive assistant, um, for a company. I worked with her for, for a minute, like doing, helping teens and, um, I wasn't ready yet to work in the field. Uh, it was, you know, my, my life was recovery and all of a sudden, like I'm working in recovery, I'm living in, it was too much. Um, so I left the field and I decided to corporate America for a few years. Uh, and then that still wasn't enough. I was miserable. I was, uh, I hated it. 
and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go backpacking through Europe. I'm 25 years old, I have all this money, I quit my job, I uh, was gonna go backpacking through Europe, and the day before I was supposed to leave, I, had a, I got asked to speak at a meeting. I went and I spoke at the meeting, and afterwards um, someone came up to me, um, Ali, and goes, hey, do you want a job? And I was like, what? She was like, I think I need you. you, you need to work for me, like you'll be great. Like, I need a counselor. Can you come work for me? And I was like, sure, but I leave for three months tomorrow. Is that okay? And she was like, yeah, come during the day, fill out the application, do everything. And then that way you can come back and you can start when you come back. And I was like, all right, but I don't want to work in treatment. And she was like, no, you have to. Uh, and, uh, and I did it and it changed my life. It, uh, you know, a lot of that healing uh, happened through helping others. I was the director of uh, recovery and alumni services for treatment center in California, um, three residentials, five PHP IOPs, and I, I loved it. I, I absolutely, like, I really found a lot of, like, that calling inside and, um, and like, healing in a way. But, yeah, that's how I ended up in the field again and um, I worked there for a few years, got burned out, decided, you know what, this is not for me. It's not my calling. Uh, I quit. I moved to Mexico. Uh, went back home, then I moved to India, did a lot of exploring uh, until I felt ready to come back. And I was like, I'm ready. This is where I miss working. Like in, you know, I was able to connect the difference between self-care as a priority. So yeah, so I, I, I shift a little and I came back and I started working in the field again. Um, and then, but I was working more on the clinical side still. And then um, I went to like an, a uh, uh, I went to an event. I was another company before that. Like I came to a different company, and I went to to a marketing event for them. And uh, it was my first. It was a conference at UCLA. My first ever marketing event. My table did not look like any of the other people that were there. Right? They all had it perfect with their cupcakes, their things. Like mine had nothing because I'd never done this. Uh, but I, I remember I was talking to people, and um, there was this one clinician that was talking to me about a case, and um, and. And she goes, yeah, like, tell me about her client and, like, how things are getting worse and, like, you know, it's been years. And I was like, have you ever considered that it might not be the right level of care? And I just remember, like, her face was like, what? What do you mean? I was like, I mean, maybe this kid needs a higher level of care than just individual therapy once a week, you know? And that's when I realized, like, what the marketing really was about. It wasn't about hey, this is how, you know, like, go to lunch, talk to people, do this, it, like, conferences. That's not what it's about. Um, it's, it, it, it's more of, like, that getting individuals into, like, proper care. I ended up changing a little because I definitely looked at outreach as sales, and I was like, I do not like sales, right? Like, nope. The four-letter word, nope. I come from a family of all sales. I'm not gonna be like my family. We're not doing sales. Uh, and you know, I realize life is all about sales, right? Like that's what we're always doing. We're selling ourselves uh, to some extent or another. Um, and it was definitely shifting that and being like in that experience in particular was like, oh, it's not about sales, you know? It's, uh, you know, this kid has just been not probably in the right level of care this whole time. And yeah, and I was sitting in my booth all by myself. I didn't know anyone of the, because I wasn't part of the outreach people. Um, and I was standing there just in my booth and the person across the hall, uh, the, across uh, the way uh, was, um, so it was James and April from OPI. Uh, April Peters and she goes hey I really like your outfit you have really good style and I was like oh thank you and then she like just kept looking at me and talking to me and she was like you're gonna work with me one day and I was like what and she was like you're gonna work with me one day and I was like oh okay like sure like I don't know what you mean but okay she was like I just know it and I was like all right cool and like, I just ended up talking to them the next two days they were really cool and like I really liked them and that was like the first people in outreach that I met right um, Paths forward later, I get a call. April goes, hey, we have a position in Bark, our company. They're hiring. They need like a DPR. Like, a, And I was like, what is that? They're like, yeah, just pretty much what you're doing, director of like, relation, uh, like you know, outreach and marketing. Um, she was like, yeah, it's the umbrella company. You know, they own, the, the Embark is the name, like OPI is under them, but you'd be working with us like hand in hand. Like they're like, you know, they're the first time ever opening in LA and like Sound California, you know, so you'd be working with me all the time. And I just laughed because like, I was like, you are, you know, like you told me I was gonna work with you one day. 
and then it kept happening. She was like, hey, how about you just talk to Thomas? Uh, he's the chief marketing. Just talk to him and kind of go from, and I was like, all right, all right. So I talked to Thomas. I ended up having like over an hour long conversation with him right on the phone, but I was still like, no, no, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'm ready. And then he was like, all right, I want you to talk to Rachel. Uh, you know, just talk to her. And I was like, talking to Rachel and then, you know, tell, like all this. I was like, but yeah, I don't know. Like, you know, I was still like dabbling like back and forth. And then all it took, it was like one message. I emailed Thomas. I was like, all right, I will, I, I'll consider it. How about I start the process? I'll consider it. Well, fast forward by the end of the week, I took the job. Um, and it was funny because I never did my research. I did not look up Embark. I uh, had no idea what Embark was. Uh, I, uh, I just like talking, like, you know, speaking to Thomas and Rachel and like April, like I had long conversations with them. It was more of like that, you know, I connected with them, like with their passion behind what they were doing. And like, yeah. And then it ended up being fast forward. I took the job and I'm never going to forget. Like I literally like looking up the website and uh, look like it was a very confusing website at the time. I was like, what is all this? Like, how do what are all these old programs? Like, I was like, what is this? Right. But I just remember clicking on the website and all of a sudden I was like, Dustin, wait a minute, John. I was like, what? And I looked at New Haven and I was like, oh my god you know it was kind of like it and I, I was like oh I guess I have to tell them I don't know if that's okay and I, I remember I called I, I was like hey so I don't know if you know this but I'm an alumni from New Haven I don't know if that's plays an impact or not I already took the job but you know that's kind of where we're at um but yeah so I took the job without knowing of any of this uh new haven and uh i just remembered i got the the email from jacqueline she does the salesforce stuff so like i needed you know and i was like oh like i know you you know like i really know you like i like i just responded saying hey i know you and she was like i thought i knew that name you know right off the bat and yeah it was a uh, full circle definitely for me uh because a lot of the big parts of why i wanted to become work in the industry, right, was a good portion of it was because of New Haven, um, of things that I had learned. But yeah, so I, I ended up taking, I, I ended up taking the job. Um, and like, I came here for training and I, I'm never gonna forget, I walked down the hall and ran into Dustin. Um, first time I saw John Stewart, you know, it was very, and I think the biggest thing was that they remembered me, you know, years later, uh, which, coming from someone who thought that she was invisible, right? Or it didn't matter, didn't make an impact. And like years later, they, they remembered. Uh, same way that I remembered everything, the impact that they had on me. For me, like it's no accident that I'm at Embark, right? It's no accident that I work here. How, like, like, especially I work alongside some of the people that like were so crucial in like planning those seats for me. And I think the best part about it for me has been that I got, I got to go, I went back to New Haven uh, again, like I told you, like, re like recently. And that's the first time I've ever been back. And I never thought that I would be back. Tell you the truth, and it was never a thought in my head. I worked in the industry, right? I did. Tr I, I used to work for an ad consultant that we, you know, like I wor I, I had clients that had gone to New Haven, but I was like so shut off to that door, um, and I I never thought that I would go back, and I did. I went back, and I went back as an alumni, and I went back, and I had the opportunity of running group with John Stewart, right? Which was amazing right and seeing like his evolution as a person as well as a clinician right like in uh you know one of the big like I, I don't really talk about it but one of the big components of it for me was um when i was there like um you know it was very different different times so when it came to lgbtqia plus it was a little uh, there was you know i felt there was a sh why well, first of all i didn't know i was part of the community back then but now looking back there was a lot of signs uh but like there was like some shame, uh, in, like, you know, and I was like worried. I was like, oh, it's Utah. It's this. Right. And uh, first day I get there, like, you know, little things that just, you know, like seeing a, a, a rainbow flag. Right. Like just like every all are welcome, like little things like that. And having a conversation with Gina, like and saying, hey, yeah, we still fall short. We still need to get better. Right. And like seeing that component of it was like a huge part of me. 
it's like a big part of it was like I got to speak to the the teens that were ready to transition, right? And like I was able to tell parents, hey, do your part, right? Like this is and they tell teens like, yeah, it's gonna be scary. Yeah, you know, you're gonna have hard times. For me, like the times that get really hard uh, when it comes to like the noise, the politics, right? Because it's like like anything, there's rules, there's, you know, like uh, that gets really hard. But for me, like my why of why I do this is so loud and center that um, it's easy to oversee that. Like anything, right, we can do better. And I think that's that's not something that we run away from uh, at all. Um, I do this job because I really want it to make an impact and like really, really like help families and what better way than like with a huge healthcare that like you have even more reach right like a bigger platform I respect the fact that like you know there is a goal in where we want to get right and like that is the goal um and yeah sometimes things get messy and it could get hard and you know it's like life like anywhere else and um and I appreciate being able to be like, hey, I don't think this is the right way to do it, right? All right, let's try it. Let's try something else. I wouldn't be here if, if, if it wasn't right. I think the biggest part that, uh, that I tried to like bring to Embark and I talked to everyone about is like, yeah, my story is pretty loud, right? It's pretty out there. Like I, you know, there's a lot of components, but like we all have a story of mental health right like every single one of us has been impacted by mental health one way or another we all have a why sometimes it's a little hard to get at so it's like holding on to that why of like helping that person find that why of like why they do what they do right um you know yes like maybe your family wasn't in treatment right but like clearly you had family stuff right and it's like breaking that stigma of mental health really is like a huge part of it. So I can personally say that, you know, we do have some of the best clinicians uh, that I, I get to work alongside with. I learn every day. The team that I get to work with in, in Southern California, like I will truly say we have some amazing clinicians and every location has their 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 uh, little, you know, magic. And for me, I will always put the family first and what the individual needs. And I know that that is like really crucial for me, um, being able to feel comfortable. And I think a lot of families that I work with and, you know, a lot of different providers that I work with, they know that I will still like, you know, there's a better fit for this person. Like I will do that. Uh, And and being able to hold on to that is very important to me. Um, And I think another big part of me was, you know, everyone deserves a chance, a second chance, a third chance, a a redo, like I always say, right? There's no cap of how many redos. Every day is a new day. Um, So being able to, like, go up to bat and fight for someone, uh, a kid who, you know, somewhere else has been rejected, rejected, and I'm like, no, we have to take a risk, right? Like, we're here to serve families. We're here to help people. We end up doing it, right? And it works. Like, it's uh, getting a little uncomfortable, and that's something I appreciate that we're willing to do. here which i think is important i really believe it's the people you know like at the end of the day like i the people that's my answer